Oh, I get it. When he says, as you wish, he's really saying, I love you. Oh, we're opening on this joke again? Hey James, we need to talk. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet we need to talk. Well, yeah, people have been getting on my case about- I thought we were the same person. Okay, fine, they've been getting on our case about doing another top 10 list. They want us to do another top 10 list about our most hated books. Or they want me to do- whatever. They want me to update it for 2020. So that's what we're gonna do today. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. So at this point, it's been several years since I did my top 10 most hated books video, and the list has shifted around a lot in that time. And just out of curiosity, I did a YouTube poll a while ago, and it seems that a couple of you wanted me to do an updated version. Just, just a couple of you. And so, here we are. Now keep in mind as I go through this list that there are some entries I took off of this because other books were worse and they just got bumped off, and there are some where, looking back on them, my tastes have changed a little bit, and I feel like I should give them more credit than before, so most of them are still bad, but I don't think they're bad enough to warrant being on the list. And others, I just didn't feel like putting on there this time. <laughs> what are you gonna do? I the rage fades away after a while. Because remember, this isn't the 10 worst books I've ever read. This is the 10 most hated books, or my 10 most hated books. Like, if the rage and annoyance aren't there, then it's not really a hated book. Anyways, uh, here we go. Let's get started. I should also point out that spoilers are major and inevitable for every book I talk about here, because I can't really talk about the worst parts without doing that. First up at number 10, we have The Fifth Wave. Now, I already did a whole long review of this series, uh, from back to front. And keep in mind, this is the entire series that I'm talking about here. It's not just one book because, well, they're all really bad and they all feed into each other. But the thing about the series is that if I could describe it in two words, it would be unfulfilled promise. I think that the first book starts off really strong, and I think it sets up what could be a phenomenal story. The issue is basically everything after that. The plot is essentially just Aliens come to Earth, they destroy most of civilization, most of the humans are wiped out, and then enter a teenage girl named Cassie, and she is just trying to survive in this world, and then she gets separated from her brother and she goes to rescue him. And if that sounds like something that would be kind of focused, don't worry, it isn't. Uh, the story, it's not good in the first book, but it is at least somewhat focused because, you know, Cassie's going to get her brother but it's also switching between several different characters, uh, and it's switching between third and first person as well, so it's just kind of jumping all over the place, and it's about multiple different things. And then once you get to the second book, there's, like, no plot at all other than we're trying to stay away from the aliens because they're going to kill us, which maybe you could do something with that, but you really do need to uh, make your stories more focused if you want your audience to care about it, because... If it's not focused, then it can't escalate, and if it can't escalate, then there's no sense of tension, and you really need a sense of tension for a story that's supposed to be this action-adventure sort of thing. And then once you get to the third book, again, they're still just running away from aliens for the most part, but then at the end, it doesn't completely come out of nowhere, but they just sort of destroy the alien ship, and then everything's good. Like, the series was never about saving the world. At least it didn't feel like that, because they barely ever talked about that. And so when they do save the world, it just comes out of nowhere, and as I said, there's no escalation to it. You know, the story goes all over the place, uh, and the characters, for that matter, are not strong enough to carry it. Like, sometimes a weak story can be carried by really strong characters, but these guys, while I'll admit I've seen worse, they're not good. Cassie has, like, two personality traits, maybe, to her. Uh, the main villain, Vosh, has... <laughs> maybe one, but he's also just the least intimidating villain of all time, because pretty much all he does is monologue. And his monologues aren't even good, I don't hate villain monologues, it's just that he doesn't actually have a point to saying anything that he's saying. It's just, yes, I'm talking and talking and talking, and it doesn't actually mean anything. And even though he is the representative of the aliens that are attacking, we never really find out why the aliens are doing what they do. Like, we know they're coming to Earth, and we know that they don't actually want to wipe out humanity, 
They want to, quote, destroy humanity's humanity and make us stop trusting each other so we become less social, so then we'll be isolated in tiny little bands that wander the countryside so we never build up civilization again. And I think that's what it's saying, at least. Like, it is extremely complex, but at least, um, yeah, I, okay. And they never say why they want to do that. Um, do they want to protect the environment? I, I don't know. But the simple, the simple fact is that we never directly interact with the aliens, and we never find out what they're doing here in the first place, so they're some of the weakest villains I've ever come across. Like, they aren't especially annoying or anything, but it is really, really uh, disheartening to see them fall that far, especially after they had such a great opening, because they did destroy the vast majority of the human population. And in addition to just really not making any sense, this the series is not written well. Like, at one point, Cassie spends and a page and a half des uh, describing the contents of her backpack, and at another point, she uses an entire paragraph-long sentence to describe how she shot a guy, and it goes into, oh man, I was screaming, and he was screaming, and it just, it, it's really obnoxious, and everything goes on way longer than it needs to. And I think maybe you could have uh, put this whole book into one, or combined this whole series into one book. It might have been salvageable, but as it stands, it just feels incredibly half-baked. Like, I've never read any other work from the author, so I can't say if he's good or not. I've, I've heard other people praise him, but I've never read any of his work, so I can't say for certain. All I know is that this feels like he had a couple of half-ideas, like not even full ideas, just a couple of halfway ideas, and never got the chance to properly uh, flesh them out before he actually started writing. And I can't say for certain, but that's what it feels like. And that's also why these books don't really have any sort of themes whatsoever. Like, they keep talking around the idea of, like, God and morality and stuff like that, but they never actually come to any sort of conclusion on it. It's just like, hey, man, do you believe in God? I don't think so. Oh, well, I'm not sure what I believe. Like, th that's all they do. And so, there's just nothing here to carry it. Nothing at all. Number nine, The Twilight Saga, New Moon. So, this one is not only still on the list, it's in the exact same place on the list, because while I'll admit there are worse books out there, that's the whole point of this video, this one, I mean, I mean, it's Twilight, you have to put one on there. And even if I will defend the first, third, and fourth books as being just sort of mediocre, you know, they're not good, New Moon is a million times worse than they are. So we've all heard the many, many, many jokes about how Twilight is just sparkly vampires and kissing and oh I love you but I also love the werewolf and that's about it but the thing is three of the four books have an actual story outside of that and it's not the greatest but like it's there you know it adds some tension there are actual villains out to do stuff the heroes are actually at risk uh, in those situations New Moon is just Edward leaves Bella and then she's sad and that's kind of the whole, that's, that's, that's everything. So it's extremely boring. That's the big thing throughout most of the book. It's just boring. And even when they try to bring in some tension near the end, it just doesn't really make any sense, so it becomes equally boring. And Bella, while she's a blank slate uh, for the most part, in this book she is just pathetic. Because her boyfriend that she she'd been with for a couple of months leaves her and so she's just gonna sit in a room and cry for like six months or something and it's it's uh, not only stupid and generally not how mental health works but it's just boring to read it's super super obnoxious and it just makes me hate Bella so much more because I do think that if this series had been like a trilogy then Bella at least would have been more tolerable because, you know, like I said, she's a blank slate throughout most of the series, but in this one in particular, I just, it, it's like someone just poking the side of my head over and over and over again, and not light pokes either, like enough to hurt a little bit after a while. Like, that's what reading New Moon feels like. But at the same time, I don't think you could have skipped it, because this is the book where you introduce werewolves, and those become important in the, uh, the last two, but 
there was really no way to organically introduce them in the first book, at least not without radically changing everything. So this book kind of needed to have the werewolves. Even if Jacob Black is the human personification of the phrase, I'm such a nice guy, why doesn't she like me? So at the end of the day, I think the Twilight Saga New Moon is the literary equivalent of an abortion. It had to happen, but it's sad that it had to happen. Number eight, the Divergent series, Allegiant. So, my most watched video of all time is still on the world building of Divergent and how awful it is. And most of the content from that video comes just from the third book. Because Divergent is all about, well, it was the first really big Hunger Games knockoff because, you know, there were tons of those. And Divergent is basically all about uh, the world has been destroyed and some survivors live in the remnants of Chicago, and they don't think anyone outside their city is still alive, but they might be, who knows. And also, in order to keep order, people are divided into five factions, and each of those each of those factions is just based on a single personality trait. Like, they have one for smart people, brave people, uh, honest people, etc. And the main character, Triss, uh, just decides to join up with Dauntless, which is the brave faction. And then... You know, some stuff happens, you know, bad guys try to take over, there's a war, and it's not a great series, I don't think, but I will defend the first two books. They're, they're all right. However, once we get to the third one, all of that goodwill was completely pissed away because they, they didn't just drop the ball. They dropped every ball they had as hard as they possibly could. So essentially, they venture outside Chicago, and they learn that, oh, there are still plenty of people out here. Uh, they learned that half of the United States population has been destroyed, which, don't get me wrong, that is a massive, massive thing, but it's not like full apocalypse the way we were thinking, so that already takes away from some of the tension and some of the world building. But in addition to that, so reading the first two books, you might be thinking, it doesn't really make sense for people to only have one personality trait, even if that personality trait is extremely dominant. It, it's just kind of weird. But I at least was willing to suspend my disbelief and just roll with it because it seemed like maybe the series was trying to make a point about how, you know, each of these traits is something we strive for, but if you have one without the others, then it's completely useless. And honestly, I'm probably giving the books too much credit, but you know, that's what I was thinking. But then it turns out that the government actually genetically modified people so that they only had one personality trait. And the main character, Triss, who is what's known as a divergent, by the way, which is someone who has more than one personality trait, and so they don't fit into the system, and so the system's... it's showing off how broken it is, really. Uh, but it turns out that divergents are literally just normal people. So, yeah, the, the main character is special because she's normal. There's, there's actually nothing special about her. She's just... the government blocked all these people into the city, and they were all, quote, genetically damaged, which are the people who only have one personality trait, and they just set them to breeding in hopes that they would produce genetically pure people, which is not how genetics work. So that alone is just a really, really dumb plot twist, and you're probably going to be hearing that a lot throughout the rest of the list, but even beyond that, the story of this last one just isn't very good. You know, they sort of change villains around and they change what the conflict is about because before it was, you know, who's going to rule Chicago and how and well without that we're just trying to build a new one from scratch and it's not particularly good. The villain is completely un unmemorable. I don't even remember his name. I just remember that when they made the movie they he was played by Jeff Daniels. And even then they're never going to make a final movie because they blew their load too quick and tried to uh, split the third book into two. And then it goes to this really weird climax where Triss has to sacrifice herself in order to save the day, and I guess it's super sad and stuff, even though she really didn't need to die. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was first reading this, I was thinking, like, her brother could have done it himself, because her brother has spent the last two books uh, being cowardly and betraying people, and this would be, like, his redemption of sorts. Like, you know what? I finally decided I want to be a good person, but, like, we don't get that, we're lost with that, and then Triss's boyfriend is super sad, and then it cuts to years later, and he's like, well, I'm sad she's gone, but you know what, I'm gonna keep living, and that's that's just about it. 
So, man, whatever subtext there was in the series, gone. Uh, whatever investment I had in the plot, gone. The world building completely falls apart. The characters weren't great before, but in this last one, they don't have much to do, or they just do stupid stuff. So, yeah, as I said, it dropped every ball it had, and it dropped them hard. Number seven, Maximum Ride Forever. I want to preface this by saying I hate James Patterson books. I, I just hate all of them so much. The the way they're written is obnoxious. They're super repetitive. Uh, most of them, uh, especially the crime thriller ones, are totally interchangeable. Like, occasionally he'll branch out and do stuff like, well, like Maximum Ride, which is a little different, but if there's no science fiction or fantasy elements, then it it's just trash. Maximum Ride is a series all about kids who were grown in a lab and they were fused with bird DNA so they have wings on their back and they can fly and stuff and several years before the series starts they escape from that lab and they're in hiding and then the lab people come to try and take them back again and that's what kicks off the bulk of the plot. Now I will say that the first three books in this series are a really solid trilogy. In fact they were supposed to end after the third book. Uh, I have a whole long video about this whole subject if you're curious about it but essentially yeah, it's kind of dumb, but there, it does have heart to it. It feels like James Patterson was telling this because, yeah, he really felt this story want, needed to be told. Um, and there are a few funny bits, some fun stuff. Like, it, it's an alright series, which I have a real soft spot for because of nostalgia. And then they just decided to keep going, and so books 4, 5, and 6 are all pretty episodic, and they all just kind of revolve around the characters trying to save the environment or something, even though all the old bad guys are dead. Uh, they just keep bringing up new ones and then never really developing them in any way, so they're just, haha, I'm bad guy. Why am I bad? Because bad guy. And sometimes the environmental message winds up shooting itself in the foot because the villains are saying, hey, we need to protect the environment, so I'm gonna kill all the humans to do it. And like, I, I mean, Trying to frame it that way does not make the environmentalist side look good. You know, if you're trying to frame it between things will stay as they are or you'll all die, most people are going to choose to stay as they are rather than, oh, okay, let's drive a little bit less and switch to green energy. And then book seven was supposed to be the last one, and it ends with, like, Paris getting destroyed, and it was kind of an unsatisfying ending, I guess, so then they started writing the book eight, which is Maximum Ride uh, Nevermore. And that one, uh, it also ends with the whole world getting destroyed this time. It's not really explained what happened. Um, but then it's like, okay, kind of an unsatisfying ending. And then a year later, for the last time, for real, we promised they released book nine, Maximum Ride Forever. And I, I know that they're making a 10th one, but that one's more of a spin-off than it is a sequel, so, you know, just work with me here. I know I had to build up a lot before I even got to this point, but that's really the main reason that I hate this one so much, is that I was getting... Fatigued is not a strong enough word, but I can't think of a better one. I was getting fatigued by Maximum Ride, and I was only pushing forward at this point because I really wanted to, uh get that uh, scripted video out, Rise and Fall of Maximum Ride. Uh, I didn't read the, this when I was a kid, when I was in the target audience, because I was just so done with it. So this book starts off with the world getting destroyed in an unspecified manner, which is super obnoxious. Thanks, James Patterson. We appreciate that. Uh, but it's also bad because all the suffering and hell that the characters went through for the past eight books is suddenly... It's pointless. It turns out it was all for nothing. And... The one thing I will say in this book's favor is that it did show the heroes fail to save the world, and then they have to deal with the consequences of that failure, which is a little interesting, and I wish they had expanded on that more, but after that it just kind of becomes a standard, hey, the bad guy is doing bad things, he's trying to kill some more of the mutants and people that are left, Let, let's go fight him and kill him, and then while this is going on, the heroes split up for really no reason, and then it gets to, oh no, this person's dead. Actually, she's alive. Oh no, this person's dead. Actually, he's kind of alive. He's in a coma. And then the third leg of the love triangle has to come in and sacrifice himself to resurrect him because he, like, electrocutes him with his own body electricity? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. And then 
Max fights a villain who is really bland and then just kills him. You know, he, like, he, doesn't, he never has a real reason for being evil, he's just evil. But that may have been saved because uh, one of his lieutenants is a guy named Jeb, who is kind of the flock's uh, adopted father. And while, uh, while he's not a very consistent character, he does switch back and forth between being good and evil a couple of times, uh, and it doesn't really make sense for him to be evil in the last book, they could have uh, worked that angle to make the conflict between him and Max seem more emotional, but instead he is about to kill Max, and then another character who was introduced just in this book comes in and kills him, and then that's, that's it. And then it cuts to years later, Max has had a baby, and they're teaching her to fly, and just... Th there's, not, there's not any sort of climax, it doesn't go out with a bang, it just sort of fizzles, and then it's over. And Max, I know, has been forced to grow up really quick, but she's still a 15-year-old girl, and it makes me a little uncomfortable that she's pregnant and having kids at that age. And obviously, it's written by James Patterson, so there's basically no description at all. Chapter 1, the world is destroyed. Chapter 2, the bad guy destroyed the world. Chapter 3, I am sad that the world is destroyed, and now my friends are splitting up. Chapter 4, one of my friends is dead. Chapter 5, oh no, she's actually alive. Chapter 6, we're gonna go fight the bad guy. Chapter 7, we're traveling to fight the bad guy. Chapter 8, we found the base where the bad guy is. Chapter 9, we're fighting the bad guy. Chapter 10, we're still fighting the bad guy. Chapter 11, the bad guy's dead. Chapter 12, I have a baby and everything's great. That's what this book feels like. Number 6, True Allegiance. So, this is another one that doesn't sound that bad on paper, because it's basically just an old-school Tom Clancy-esque thriller, where there's, like, terrorists going out to destroy America, and the good guys have got to stop the terrorists. And, you know, that's fine. That, that sounds okay. You could make, maybe do a story about that. Uh, but it was written by Ben Shapiro, professional opinion haver. And, look... Before you get on me about saying, you need to put your politics aside when you're reading this book, you only hate Ben because he disagrees with you, well, I can't set my politics aside when reading this book because Ben obviously didn't bother to set his politics aside when he was writing it. Every other paragraph is filled with some sort of screed about how he's right and people who agree with him are the smartest folks ever and anyone who disagrees is not only wrong, but they're selfish and evil and disgusting. And it's just really, really grating to read after about three pages. And that's not even counting how a lot of the uh, ideas he tries to push are just straight up disgusting. Like how he thinks it's okay for Americans to kill civilians in wartime, but at the same time, if terrorists from other countries kill any American civilians, it's because they're irredeemably evil. Or how he thinks that the black community is faking police shootings in order to get sympathy. And how uh, black community leaders who you know, come out and denounce things like that are actually secretly crack dealers. Or how uh, terrorists who agree with Ben are still the good guys. You know, there's literally a character in this who... Basically, she lost her farm because of government environmental regulations, so she built a giant truck bomb and blew it up outside the EPA headquarters. And the thing is, you could maybe do something with a character like that. You could maybe use it to show how someone could... Uh, be pushed to the limit and finally become a terrorist who's willing to kill innocent people in order to affect change, uh, and then you could just come right out and say, yeah, that's not okay, but instead he just says, yeah, it's okay when you do it, but it's bad when they do it. And even if you set all of that aside, which again, you fucking can't, it's just a dumb story. It's really, really dumb. It's kind of a fascinating window into Shapiro's mind, but it does not make any sense. Like, the, the main crux of the plot is how Iraq actually did have nuclear weapons, and the, the U.S. was right to invade them, but they actually hid those nuclear weapons in Iran, so the U.S. never found them. You know, because Iraq and Iran really get along so well. You know, it's not like they fought the deadliest war since World War II against each other. No, no, that, that never happened. All the Muslim countries, they're, they're just one blob, then. They don't have their own internal divisions. You're so smart. The characters are two-dimensional at best? Like, the most I can say about uh, one or two of them is that they are consistent, and they aren't too hypocritical, but other than that, the characters just sort of do whatever they want based on what the plot demands. It's written terribly, 
like how it describes cars falling into a river as bath toys of an angry god, and just a lot of dumb shit like that, and, well, I think this one is kind of a shame, because as I said, if you changed, let's be honest, everything about it, you could probably do an okay story with this setup, but Shapiro just did not bother setting his own politics aside, and he just decided to use it as a propaganda mouthpiece. He wanted to show how his worldview is the correct one, because he invented a fake story where his worldview is the correct one, I guess. And, well, it it is kind of sad, because if he hadn't done that, then this book might have been okay. Number five, Throne of Glass. Okay, I'm gonna be up front right now. This book, th or this whole series, rather, is not the worst thing I've ever read, like I said, uh, and it's not the most hated thing I've ever read, which is why it's at number five on the list, but it is the most miserable experience I've had relating to running this channel. Because as awful as most of these other entries on this list are, they eventually end. Throne of Glass just does not end. The story starts off like a typical young adult fantasy. There is an assassin named Selena, who's like the most badass badass in the history of badassery, who is forced to compete in a tournament for the king so that she can gain her freedom from prison, but actually the king is evil and so that sucks. And then rebellion, rebellion starts, etc. More stuff. Don't forget the love triangle. But then when it starts, it's not only a clumsy rendition of all these terrible young adult tropes, it is just unpleasant at every opportunity it can be. Now, I said when I reviewed it way back when that the series feels like it was originally structured as a trilogy, and that's because it was. It was originally supposed to be a trilogy, and they expanded it to seven books by the end. Like, the first book kind of feels like a prologue, and then it's very easy to see that two, three, and four were all uh, developed as a trilogy. And if it had ended there, I think this would have been tolerable. Like, it still would have been bad, but I don't think it would have made it on this list because it would have been tolerable. It, it would have ended. But the fact, just at the end of the fourth book, they finally defeat the evil king, but like a fucking 90s JRPG villain, he says, oh no, I was actually possessed by a demon the whole time, and the demon is the one that's doing all the evil things, so now you have to spend another three books fighting that guy. And I think the moment I saw that, I knew that there was no way this series was going to be redeemable. Like, like, unless you completely changed everything about it and did like a page one rewrite, there is no salvaging this. In addition, the main character changes her name partway through the series, and like, I know that she's a secret princess, so she was hiding her identity, and then, so she finally starts going by the name Aelin, but it's still really obnoxious to have to do that halfway through. And she's also just never challenged in any way. She's one, not a, the most insufferable Mary Sue ever, we'll get to that in a minute, but she is up there. You know, like I said, she's just the most badass fighter of all time. She can, e even without her magic, she can go in and fight 20 dudes at once and still come out on top. And then when she does get her magic, she can just shoot out fire and destroy entire armies because she's literally chosen by the gods. And then when it comes around that she has to sacrifice herself to save the big bad guy, one of her friends comes in and, oh, it turns out, Actually, neither of us has to sacrifice anything. Yeah, like, you'll give up some of your power, but, you know, th that's not a big deal. You're alive now. And so, just, she never has to give anything up, and uh, most of the other main cast members don't have to sacrifice anything. Like, there's no major deaths in this entire series other than one in the second book. And even then, we didn't spend enough time with that character to really care about them, so it doesn't mean that much. Uh, and then there's the fact that Aelin slash Selena gets into, like, multiple love triangles, and it's all really annoying, and it treats it like the way a lot of young adult uh, series treat romance, which is really obnoxious in that you can look at your partner and just know what they're thinking. Like, at one point, she and her partner have an entire, like, over a page long conversation where it's like, his eyes seem to say this, and then... It, it's like they have telepathy, except they don't have telepathy, and it's really stupid. And then it just straight up turns into porn in the middle of the fifth book. I am not exaggerating when I say that. It is straight up porn. 
They spend multiple pages describing characters having sex and in pretty graphic detail. Like, Sarah J. Moss, I don't know if you just really wanted to write erotica, but if that's the case, just go write erotica. Don't try and cram it into this thing that's meant for teenagers. It's really obnoxious and a little gross, if I'm being honest. And as I said, this may, may have been tolerable if it hadn't gone on for so long. It's seven books, none of which are short. I think the shortest of them is still over 400 pages and the longest is pushing 700. It's never, it's never ending. It, it's just a deluge of more and more shit that you don't care about because I, I think that Sarah J. Moss just thinks that making something long makes it epic because there are huge tracts of multiple books that are just taken up by tertiary characters traveling. Like the fifth book in particular, uh, at least 40% of it is just a side character and another side character traveling to bring something important to Aelin. And you could cut out pretty much the entirety of that. Like you just say, oh, she was traveling and she ran into this dude. Like you, you could maybe do it all in three chapters because it's not like anything interesting is even happening. They aren't fighting the bad guys or anything, they're just kind of hiding out, and then they join a circus, and... Oh my god, it's... Hmm, no. Like, like, I, like, I'm, like I keep saying, it's so long, it just never ends. It keeps going forever, and you'll never escape it. That's why I hate Throne of Glass so much. Number four, The Fifth Sorceress. Through some weird coincidence, this is the second entry on the list that has the word fifth in the title, but I mean, that's just a coincidence, like I said. So this one was on the list last time, it's still on the list this time because there is nothing good here. Okay, it's like the author Robert Newcomb actually admitted at one point that he'd never read epic fantasy before, and he just decided he wanted to write one. And so The Fifth Sorceress comes across as Lord of the Rings if it was written to be femdom porn. I'm not joking about that last bit, by the way. We'll, we'll get more to it in a minute, but... Like, okay, so this starts off as just kind of generic and cheesy, but you think maybe it'll be fun. It's basically uh, many hundreds of years before the story begins, there was this thing called the Sorceress War, and I guess women having powers is bad because women are evil and just want to take over when they have power, whereas men just want to... Yeah, okay, we're, we're not even touching on that because that's a whole other box of worms, but basically, yeah, there are five more sorceresses left, or actually four sorceresses left, that they send across to another continent, and spoiler alert, there is a fifth sorceress who's still staying behind and causing trouble. Then we enter Tristan, the main character, who is actually a prince, not rather than a farm boy, so that's nice, I guess, and he's really stupid. You know, he describes multiple women as the most beautiful women he'd ever seen. He constantly gets himself and others into danger. Uh, he's extremely slow on the uptake and needs everything explained to him in many page long monologues. And okay, maybe that could work if he was, or at least be less annoying if he was like 16 or 17, the way a lot of these protagonists are. He's 30. There is no excuse for it. Like, this dude is the most obnoxious man-child that I've ever had to read about. And I've had to read about several. Remember, Ben Shapiro's on this list. And the thing is that most of the story would not have happened if other characters hadn't been idiots either. Because the thing is, uh, the wizards, uh, when they're coronating Tristan, they have to uh, basically take off this necklace and dip it in water in order to give it power, and then they give it to Tristan, and then suddenly he'll be the powerful king. Um, but there's a brief moment while they're doing that where none of the wizards have power and so they're all in grave danger. And a character specifically brings up, hey, something bad might happen. I think what we should do is we should do the ceremony uh, down in the basement where no one's there and then just do a public ceremony which is all for show for the public. And then they say, no, no, we have to because tradition, I guess. And then Lo and behold, the bad guys come in and attack them and kill most everybody except Tristan and his friend Wig, and then they kidnap Tristan's sister and bring her off. So then Tristan and Wig just travel to the other continent. It's super easy, but it takes them a long time. And then by the time they get there, Tristan's sister has been brainwashed, and now she's going to be uh, part of the five sor sorceress circle. And then Tristan is captured, and he gets raped by one of the sorceresses. 
uh, which is actually the second time in the book he gets raped, but I guess the first one doesn't count because he didn't climax. Definitely not how rape works, Robert Newcomb. And then it turns out that the bad guy's evil plan was to kill everybody on Earth except for the five sorceresses and Tristan, and then repopulate with their magically gifted inbred babies. Points for originality, I suppose, but it's really dumb. And then obviously Tristan uh, escapes and overthrows him, and then the lady who raped him is pregnant, but because of magic, she's about ready to give birth after like three days, and then she lost her power, she doesn't want to live anymore, so she jumps off a building and kills herself, and then Tristan cuts her open and buries her and his baby next to each other, and then the epilogue is like some sort of god or other being picking the baby up, bringing it back to life, and it's, uh, it's kind of gross. So as I said, there is multiple scenes of women on men rape in this, and there's a lot of parts where women are shown to be like sexual deviants with unsatiable appetites, and they like hurt men, they whip them and stuff, and I'm, it genuinely feels like the whole thing was typed with one hand. Like, Newcomb, I get it, you're, you're into some stuff. I'm seriously not judging you for that. I am judging you for putting it in this book, though and just broadcasting your baggage so loudly for the entire world to see. Because the fifth sorceress is a miserable experience. Like, it starts off as maybe just a traditional cheesy epic fantasy story, and then it just, through a series of extremely dumb decisions, each of which is worse than the last, it becomes borderline unreadable. Like. The only reason that this and others like it are more fun than Throne of Glass is because I can at least laugh at this one, whereas I couldn't at that. And this one, yeah, uh, yeah, it's just nothing but monologues where people explain exposition, but also never really explain how magic works. Like, I still don't know much about this world or about magic. Um, at one point, the author uh, clearly changed what he wanted to call coins and started spelling it differently. And I guess the editor just, just didn't pick up on that, because this book was clearly not properly edited. And it failed for a reason. You know, it's only really known among fantasy fans because it's so terrible. And that reputation is well-deserved. Number three, Elixir. I can summarize a lot of what's wrong with this book in a single sentence. It was written by Hilary Duff. Yep, Lizzie McGuire herself. That's the only reason I even found out about these, and why I decided, oh, those sound terrible, let's read them. And yeah, they were terrible. At its core, it's basically just a Twilight knockoff, where it's, you know, normal girl runs into supernatural boy, they fall in love, and then there's some other sort of supernatural conflict. Which, that's not inherently bad, uh, but this fails to even follow the formula properly. So, essentially, the plot is, this girl named Clea Raymond, or Clea Raymond, uh, is famous because she's the daughter of a senator. Okay. Uh, and she's also like super beautiful, but also super plain, and yada yada yada. And her father went missing before the story began because he was looking for the elixir of life, or the elixir of youth. I forget, I forget which one it is. I think the book actually uh, switches back and forth between them, so that's, um, again, not properly edited. But uh, he went missing, and then she looks at some of her pictures, and she notices that there's this one guy just sort of in the background of all of them from the time she was a baby, and it's kind of unsettling. And then she runs into that guy in real life, and it turns out that he's 500 years old, he drank the elixir of life that time, that long ago, and Clee was his girlfriend back then, and every hundred years she gets reincarnated and then dies before she really gets a chance to be with him. But not only that, uh, the third leg of their love triangle, which in this life is her friend Ben, is also uh, connected to them and re is reborn every hundred years, and he actually, his whole thing is to get cuckolded by the other guy, and then do something which accidentally leads to his girl's death, and I guess that's tragic and cyclical or something. So they go off looking for Klee's father, and they uh, kind of give up on that, actually. Yeah, the, the ending of the first book is them looking for information, and then they find some information, and then Sage gets kidnapped, uh, Sage is the immortal bad boy, and then the second book is just about them rescuing Sage. And then the third book, at the very beginning, she's visiting her dad's grave. And Clay's like, I miss you, Dad. And it, like, weren't you looking for him? 
Last you saw, he was still alive. And, and that's what I mean. This story isn't really about anything. It doesn't follow the Twilight formula properly, because even books that are bad that follow that formula are at least about something. And this one isn't. It's about, okay, trying to save my dad. And then it's about, oh, my boyfriend is immortal, and I don't know how I'm going to deal with that. And then it's about, oh, I need to stop the curse on me. And then it's about, oh, this family of psychics who just gain psychic powers by thinking about it really hard are now trying to kill my boyfriend so they can get more elixir of life. And then it's, oh, my boyfriend's dead, but it's okay, his soul went into another guy's body. And then in the third book, uh, it turns, uh, Klee's best friend gets angry at them because she thinks that they faked her boyfriend's death because Klee and her boyfriend were cheating on her. And it doesn't make sense in context either. And then at the end of the third book, they're finally going to fix everything. Uh, but then the bad guy literally just writes down his evil plan in a notebook and someone else sees it, so they're able to stop him. And then happily ever after, I guess. In addition to just not being about anything, none of the characters even stand out, e even in terms of, like, stupidity or anything. They're just complete blank slates. There there's no personality anywhere here. None at all. And, well, I think that speaks for itself, really. And then the story, as I said, goes all over the place, and it's just utterly, awfully written. You know, there's lines like, oh god, I don't even want to say it out loud, but the worst line in the series is obviously when uh, Klee is talking to her friend about whether or not she likes this dude, and Klee says, no, he's like my brother. And then her friend says, hey, I read Flowers in the Attic, it was kinda hot. Anyone who's read Flowers in the Attic knows that, um, just, nope, nope, nope. I, I hated that line so much that I think this might have been placed at, like, five on the list if it weren't for that one single line. <laughs> and there's others that are not quite that bad, but also sprinkled throughout. And, well, I don't know how much I can talk about this that, uh, that I haven't already said before. It's just horrible in every way, but at least it's pretty funny. Number two, the House of Night series. Okay, so this one, again, I have a long review of it. And even in that hour 49 minutes, I could not bring up everything that I hated about this series because there just was not enough time. Like, I could sit here for probably four or five hours, no exaggeration, and describe all the bad things in that book series because it is the worst thing ever. <laughs> it's so horrendous in every way. Okay, so it, it starts off seeming like maybe it's a Twilight knockoff because it's young adults about vampires and there's a lot of romance in it. Really, it's more of a Harry Potter ripoff because the main character is this girl named Zoe and one day she gets marked as, oh, she's going to become a vampire because in this world, vampires are just sort of born at random among humans. Like, they, they don't, you don't have to be bitten or anything like that. You just, one day someone will say, hey, you're going to turn into a vampire and then you do, so... Okay, that's fine. Uh, but they're not really good as vampires either because they don't have to drink blood to survive they don't have to stay out of the sun they don't have to be invited before they can enter your home and also they have some magic powers which are really weak but you know it it makes them essentially wizards more than they are vampires and then there's an evil villain who wants to take stuff over because her cat died i'm not joking when i say that like that was the main motivation for the villain's actions throughout the whole series. Her cat died when she was younger, and that made her sad. And I'm constantly amazed that despite this book going to crazy places all over the time, all uh, throughout the series, it always manages to revert to the status quo very quickly. Like, uh, in fact, every book ends with them setting the villains back further. Like, every single one, no joke. Like, the villains never gain a leg up on the heroes at all. So, any tension that might have been there is just completely gone. Uh, and for that matter, they also defeat the villains the exact same way every time. They just form a magic circle together, and then they can just do whatever they want, it seems. There, there's really no explanation for anything in this series. But over the course of it, they meet a fallen angel type dude who is also the father of a bunch of demons because he raped a bunch of Cherokee women, 
and then later they try to redeem him, and he becomes a good guy, which... Okay, look, maybe you can do that with murder, because... Well, you might be put into a position where you have to kill someone someday, and there are times where we hear about someone killing somebody else, and we're like, you shouldn't do that, but... I kind of get it, you know, there, like, there's some circumstances where we understand you might have to kill somebody. You're never going to have to rape anyone. And so, that uh, character bit not only fell completely flat for me, but it was just kind of gross. And then there's another time where they, like, go to Italy, and Zoe is apparently going to become the Vampire Queen one day, because, I don't know, but we'll get back to that in a little bit. And then her soul is taken to another world, uh, but then it comes back, and then status quo is returned. They go back to the house at night, they continue living their school life. And then, at one point, uh, Zoe's boyfriend is killed, and the main villain brings his soul back into the body of Zoe's dead mother. And that's kind of crazy and stupid and fun, but it just winds up reverting back to, okay, they're in school learning magic now. Like, this series has some potential, I will admit that. Like, they're not really ideas, but like seeds of ideas that could be interesting if they were utilized properly, and they just do absolutely nothing with any of them. It just gets... It, it gets worse and worse as time goes on, because, uh, well, like a lot... Uh, kind of like Throne of Glass, it's way longer than it needs to be. It's 12 books long, and it's more repetitive than even Throne of Glass, because it just... It, it always uh, defaults back to, okay, we're at school, and the villains are still out there, but we're going to get them one day. And out of the entire pretty big character cast, there was one that I sort of liked. That was Aphrodite, who starts off as just sort of like a classic, generic, mean girl uh, archetype, but then you realize, okay, her parents are kind of manipulating her into it, and so you feel a little bit for her, and then she becomes a better person later, but she's still kind of a bitch, and she's like, hey, this is who I am, take it or leave it. Okay, uh, it's not a great character, but I can work with it. But I have never in my life hated a more obnoxious Mary Sue than Zoe Redbird. Because everything about her, it, well, everything is about her, yeah, actually. <laughs> the story isn't about anything else, it's about how awesome she is, like... As soon as she becomes a vampire, she gets visited from Nyx, the goddess of vampires, and she tells her, hey, you're super special, and you're going to accomplish great things. Okay, and then she goes to school, and she learns her magic is super powerful, and she has skill in all five elements, which no one else has ever had, because, you know, she didn't have to work for it, but she's just that special. And then she runs into the vampire queen, and the vampire queen is like, I'm going to make you the queen when I die, because she's just that special. And then she gets into uh, a love Septagon uh, at some point in the series. Uh, she is involved with uh, six or seven other dudes. And, okay, that's bad enough because it's, oh, all these dudes are into me. But it's really creepy in a couple of ways because one of the dudes is, you know, that rapist fallen angel, like I said before. And one of them is one of her teachers who's in his 20s. And he actually does take her virginity. And I guess it's kind of framed as a bad thing, but it's framed as a bad thing because he was manipulating her, not because he was too old for her, and there's a off-color power dynamic there. But to make it even worse, Zoe cheats on her boyfriend with him, and then the book has the gall to make us think that her boyfriend is the asshole, or to try and make us think that her boyfriend is the asshole because he's angry at her and breaks up with her. And then later, it has him apologize to her because Zoe is just that cool and just that special. Like, the entire world just revolves around her. Like, all the other people, all the villains and their plans, everything revolves around Zoe Redbird. And that, more than anything, is what kept this from being uh, kind of enjoyable. Because there are a lot of really dumb moments in this, which are really funny. Like, at one point, in order to avoid getting in trouble at school, the main heroes calling a bomb threat on a bridge. Yeah, like, that that happens. And it's really stupid and funny, but I could not get into this series uh, just for the sheer entertainment of laughing at it because Zoe is the most obnoxious Mary Sue I have ever, ever come across. I hate her so much. The whole... Everything is just about her. Every... 
thing connects to her in some way, and not only does it connect to her in some way, but she's at the center of it, and, well, there's only so many different ways I can say that, but Zoe Redbird deserves to die. And finally, number one, The Lovely Bones. Yeah, like, anyone who's surprised has not been watching my channel for that long. What else even is there to say about this? Okay, I was forced to read it for school when I was 15, and it's all about a 14-year-old girl who was raped and murdered, and then she's, like, watching her family from the afterlife, which... That sounds kind of interesting, but they never actually do anything with it, because the guy who murdered her, her family is kind of looking at... Uh, investigating him for a little while, trying to find evidence of what he did, and maybe stop him from hurting other people, but then... They just give up on that plot thread pretty early on. Um, because, you know, there's no value in trying to save the lives of other people, because he continues his serial murdering after that, and the only time he dies is in a total accident. Like, in the movie, I think, I haven't actually seen it, and I never will, but I think it's implied that, like, Susie actually kills him, and it just looks like an accident, but in the book, nope, it's 100% an accident, and... There's really no point to it. Like, it's not even a character study where we see where we see him uh, on his journey to become a serial killing rapist because we don't get any real time with that. You know, we sh we see him as a kid and he's kind of unhappy, and then we see his mother uh, got thrown out of their family by his father, and he never saw her again. But we never see what was between that and serial murdering. Like, he just he just is one. Um. Yeah, 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 no, 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 it's, uh, there's nothing there. And then all the characters are just the most selfish, hateable people ever. And some people have defended this book saying, oh, well, you know, real people would act that way in that situation. Like how her, Susie's mom abandons the family afterwards because she just can't deal with, uh, being reminded that her daughter's dead. Like, you know, she can't be in the same house and everything. And like, yeah, I get it. There's no real going back to normal after that, but I... That doesn't change the fact that it makes her mother super hateable, okay? Realistic and likable are very different things. And, well, much like a lot of the other entries on this list, this story isn't really about anything. You know, it's about her family investigating the serial killer, and then it's about her family trying to cope with it, and then it cuts to years later, and her family is just moved on, and it's them living their lives, and then it's about Susie in the afterlife, just kind of doing stuff, and then at the end, oh my god, I hate even bringing this up, but at the end came a scene that's so bad that when I read it, it gave me a headache, meaning that this caused me physical pain, and, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this. Uh, basically, Susie decides to sort of visit the uh, guy that she liked when she was alive. And the way she does that is she inhabits the body of one of her old classmates and then has sex with the other dude. So, um, she, she essentially just, like, raped her friend. That's... that's bad on its own. But when you consider that she was raped and murdered before she... Oh dear. Look, guys, rape just sets me off, okay? I don't really like reading or hearing about it. It makes me really angry. And I feel justified in that, because as I said earlier, you, you might have to kill, but you'll never have to rape. And just the fact that the author is like so up her own ass and this book is so up its own ass about how, no, I'm teaching you things. Look, th this is saying something. Like, the entire book just feels like it's pressing in your face. This means something. This is deep. I'm doing a character study. This is how people are. People are weird. And it's okay to rape someone sometimes. And even shit like Flowers in the Attic and other exploitative things, they're at least honest about how they're exploitative trash. You know, they aren't trying to send a real message or anything. They're just like, here's some suffering porn. But the fact that The Lovely Bones is that, combined with this holier-than-thou attitude, just sets me off in ways that I... 
I, I can't even really describe them. Like, the, a big part of the reason why I waited so long to do this 2020 update to this is because, well, I didn't want to retread the same ground. Like, the, I highly doubt there will ever be a book I read that is worse than The Lovely Bones. And if it is, I, I just, I don't want to ever run into one because it's unpleasant in every way. I hate this. I hate the author. If you like the book, I kind of hate you too. Like, I'm never one to get on people about their preferences, but in this case, I feel justified in doing so. Now is the time for the verbal shout-out for my $10 and up patrons. Apo Savalainen, B. Quinn, Brother Santodis, Christopher Quinten, Embis, Emily Miller, Evan Stigall, Joel, Karkat Kitsune, Madison Lewis Bennett, NB Star, Sad Mardigan, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, Vacuous Silas, and Vavictus. You guys are the best, as well as all the other names here. And if you want to get stuff like early access to my videos, and you can suggest new content, you want to get your name on here, then consider donating to my Patreon. And if you either can't do that, or you just hate me and don't want to do that, then, well, liking this video, commenting on it, and sharing it around really helps to get the word out. And even if you dislike it, that also boosts it in the algorithm. So really, no matter what, I win here. Uh, anyways, see you guys later.